Alright, here we are, Michael, with this dojo, funnily enough, I just managed to we are. sneak in. Uh, thank you very much to DK for inviting us in. Uh, this is the uh, end of year special, and so what you're about to hear are some of the golden moments, not all of them, from all of the people that we spoke to during the year. What we're going to do is we're going to batch them up and tell you who's coming next. Uh, we're going to do it in chronological order, starting with Mel, I believe was our first ever one. Oh, Sean, Sean Golding. Sean Golding. Um, episode 30, and we'll work all our way through to the final one, which will be Emma, I do believe. Emma, yep, she's the last episode one. Episode 78. 77 or... 78. Yeah. So yeah. we're just taking out 30 seconds, up to about two minutes, um, or, um, out of each of the interviews. And this is a great chance to hear the gold that everyone spoke. So the first segment is with Sean Golding. And then we have Melissa Clark Reynolds. And then Ruth McDavid, who became CEO of Summer of Tech. And then we've got Vaughan, who's the CEO of Vaughan Rousel, CEO of Vend. Um, Anna, from Anna Gunther from Pledge Me. And then Lillian Grace. At the time it was Wiki New Zealand, but now we know it, of course, as Figure.nz. Yeah. Enjoy. The problem is with uh, film work is that I find in Wellington it's not really an industry. It's more just one guy playing and you, you yeah. come and play with his toys. And then when the uh, it's time to go to bed, everyone has to go home. Yes. And uh, he gets to keep all his toys. That's a great way to put it. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I was becoming pretty cynical. So it was, it was the right time for me. And it worked out very well with the um, two years on The Hobbit. Saved a bit of coin. Got some of my good friends together. Said, I want to do this. I want a bar. And they, uh, they said, shit, yeah, let's get stuck in. Excellent. So, um, yeah, I built this bar. And uh, have a look back, really, two years on. Yeah. And it's been a terrific experience for me. It really, really has. I'd like to say it's been really difficult, but it actually hasn't. It's actually been, <laughs> awesome. it's actually been very straightforward. I'm not going to say the word easy, because nothing that would undermine what people have been doing for me. So I've great support in my business partners, and, of course, my staff have made it incredibly easy for me as well. So I, could, I just get to enjoy myself, mm. which is really nice, which gives the bar a nice tone too, a nice, easy, sincere tone that it actually is an enjoyable place to drink as well. Yeah. How can you have like an eight-part cereal about cereal, like podcasts it's about cereal? There's so many cereals you could oh, talk know. about. You know? So you I'm going to be clear on, you know? yeah, so I'm not a wheat box entrepreneur, but I am a cereal <laughs> entrepreneur, and I think yeah. well, there should be more of them in New Zealand. I think often what happens is you, you're not going out of the park and you think, oh yeah, I know something. Mm. And actually, and what happens is a lot of people who do that, they're not going out of the park, they think they know something, and then they're actually too scared to do it again in case that next one fucks up. Mm. See what I mean? Like so. I thought they were lucky the first time. Yeah, maybe I was just lucky. Yeah, yeah. And then I think one of the best things that's happened to me is then having a couple of failures after knocking one out of the park because you go, shit, maybe I really don't know anything, which is actually the truth. Like we really don't know anything. So I think it's. Oh, quite I think you must know. You might know something you now. Know something. Yeah. I don't know something. It, but it doesn't not necessarily mean that more than anyone else. But you. Well, you get to do it faster. Teach. I think that's what's been good for me is that the the more companies I've either founded or been really involved with, the faster I've got at stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so what might have taken me seven years in my first business pretty much only takes a year or two now, uh, okay. yeah. you know, um, and I think too I've really learnt some methodologies as well along the way that help you know, nail stuff down, and there are more and more people, when I think about, like I started my first proper business in 1992, I had started one earlier than that, but um, it was, it was self-employment, and I don't consider self-employment to be a business, mm -hmm. so when I meet people and they go, oh, I'm in business, and then it turns out like they sell their time. Yeah. <laughs> by at themselves home. at home yeah. or from a cafe, I just go, yeah, whatever. You know, I don't, there's nothing wrong with doing that, right? I mean, you can make a good living and everything, but they're not well, in business. Matter, yeah. Yeah. business person. So for me, like, the big difference between being, say, self-employed and being an entrepreneur is you're really trying to create something outside of what you are, you know? Mm. And I now have decided I'm only going to start businesses I know nothing about. Oh, yeah? You know, and that sounds quite crazy. Huh? Because yeah, I think the cool thing about that then is that you've got a chance of being like less um, emotionally kind of connected yes. to what it is. Do you know what I mean? And you've got a chance of being a little more dispassionate. We talk about fast fail and stuff. I think you can do fast fail a whole lot better if you know you don't know it. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that you've got a much better chance. As an entrepreneur, like the job is really is to find all those worker bees and everything, to find some drones, to find a queen, to find some worker bees and get them out there making something very cool. And I think you've got a better chance of finding that rock star team if you don't think you're one of them. 
where is it painful? What's the biggest challenge? It's actually not the talent. This is New Zealand's worst kept secret. There is no talent shortage in New Zealand. Ooh. We have plenty of talent coming through. The okay. challenge that we've... we wrong <laughs> yeah. many, many times. We might have said that a couple of times. <laughs> the challenge that we've got is, is helping companies understand that they, they need to invest a bit of time and they need to look beyond highly qualified, highly experienced employees. So obviously, if you need someone highly qualified and highly experienced, an undergrad is not necessarily going to deliver that type of, of, of skill to your company. But if you can look at your long-term hiring, your talent development, and your giving back side, a lot of the volunteers that we have on the program are senior tech people, and they remember what it was like trying to get their first chance. Yep. So that's the conversation that we have with the IT employers. How can you strategically recruit interns? It's a summer, it's a chunk of work. You need to pay them. So that is one of our key philosophies, yep. is that they are paid employees while on short-term contract. Mm -hmm. They need to be part of your team, and you need to invest some time up front to make sure that they're delivering value, and you're, you're giving them a real kickstart on their career. How did you attract others to equally love the idea and the product and the... You know, who's the first follower and, the, and then you went from there? How, how, what did you do? Go, oh, I'm, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, just tell the story. Tell the big story. You know, and constantly, constantly tell the story over and over and over again because um, you never know who's listening. Mm. And it's the same story. Like, well, you know, slightly different story if you're talking to customers and why they should get on board and things. But generally, there's also the other story, which is around, you know, why you are going to be the next big thing. And you don't have to go around saying that you're going to be a, a billion dollar business and all that sort of thing. You just need to talk it up and that, you know, uh, you're aspirational. You're aiming high. You're aiming high and you know uh, how to get there. And you just tell that story lots. And so I started telling that story even before we had a product. And, uh, and actually that's how we attracted one of our uh, Cornerstone investors was uh, a German investor, um, Christoph, who, uh, who got in touch with me pretty early on in the, in the story, because he heard me tell the story at uh, an event in um, San Francisco. Ah. And this was one of those events, uh, pre-launch events, where you don't even have to, have to have a product, you just need to be able to talk shit and convince everybody that... Articulate your idea and yeah. sell some. <laughs> and convince people that it's a good idea. And so uh, I must have done that, because Christoph reached out to me the week after, asked if we could jump on Skype and have a chat. And to me, he was just some uh, random German guy. Mm. But I was you know, more than happy to tell him my story. And that's the thing. It's like, you, you never know. Like, mm. he was just a random German guy. So I jumped on Skype and shared everything. My hopes, dreams, aspirations, numbers, you know, all real. Yeah. And, uh, and then we kind of kept in touch every every other month or every month. I can't remember. Maybe it was every month. We, we kind of jumped on Skype and, you know, gave him a bit of an update on how things were going. And then about nine months in, he asked if, if I needed an investment. And at the time I didn't because I'd you know, just secured some, in, some local investment. So, you know, I probably did the wrong thing and I said no. <laughs> Somebody is offering you money and you say no. You don't need it? You don't need it? No, but then yeah. a, year, a year later, you know, we still kept in touch. And a year later, when we needed some more money, I reached out to Christoph and... Uh, he became a, a cornerstone investor and has invested several times since. Um, and yeah, if I hadn't have been telling that story and had this random connection with him, then you know, and you know what I learned about Christoph on the journey is that he was the early stage investor behind Zendesk. And so you know, the thing that he liked about Ben was it was a very similar story, and he, he was hearing a similar story to the stories that he heard from the founders of Zendesk back, yeah. back in the day. So. And so, yeah, that's, that's the key piece of advice I give people these days. It's like, just tell every motherfucker you meet your story yeah. and, uh, and be passionate about it and, 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 and think big and talk big because you never know. Yeah. You know, and we've brought on a ton of investors who have all come through you know, that approach where, you know, the first time I met them, they were just somebody. You tell them the story, they get interested. Um, and then at some point, you know, they confess that they're actually interested enough that they want to invest in, in, in your thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if uh, we're just particularly good at telling the story or, uh, or it just works. 
right? I think. But you must have a good story as well. As in you've a got story to have a good story. Which, yeah. As you say, it's real. You've got numbers that are it's real. It's got to be like, real. You can't be, oh, we'll be the next you can't Google be, or the next... You know, yeah, yeah, you, you can't, can't be... Like that anymore. No. You can't <laughs> bullshit people. Yeah. yeah. Because you've got to back it up. Mm. And, and a story isn't just, you know, uh, you know, there is that whole myth of, you know, the elevator pitch. Yeah. So you meet an investor and you've got 15 seconds to convince them yes. that you're, you're a thing and they should they should totally take a look at you. It's like, that's bullshit. I've never, ever had that, you know. All of our investors have come about from a long series of conversations and it's always been months, months and months and months of conversations. And so just treat everybody you talk to as a potential investor mm. uh, or a potential customer mm. or a potential fan, right? Yeah. You know, and you know, because you build a great story and it's compelling enough, then of course they're going to tell other people about this this amazing thing that they heard about, uh, and that's probably how you get your first customers. And that's how I got our first customers was telling that story. And it's like, oh, I know somebody who's, who's in retail. They should have a look at your stuff. That's right. I would say plant the seed, yeah. and it may not be that person who who is, will be that person that does whatever you need them to do. But if it's good enough, they'll pass the seed on. They'll don't, pass don't like a little else. gift yeah. that you've given them and they'll go, oh, that's nice, I'll pass a bit of that on. And eventually it will arrive to that person, that place where it needs to be, and you'll get a phone call. Out of the blue, you'll know how they got there. Because there there. people are generally happy to help anybody out, right? Yes. It's just one of those things. It's like we like helping other people out. Mm. Yeah. So you should totally leverage that, you know. But yeah, a very exciting time because equity crowdfunding is a new type of crowdfunding, which um, New Zealand has changed their legislation to allow, which means that companies can actually sell shares um, instead of just offering rewards when they crowdfund. Um, they can still offer rewards, but they're actually allowed to issue shares, which is very, very exciting because it just changes the model. Mm -hmm. um, it means that you know you don't have to have an expensive public prospectus to go to the public. Um, and it sort of, yeah, it just empowers companies to raise capital through the people they know. Yes, so the current version... Um I took live about two and a half years ago, and that was you know me going right. We want to, I want to make data more accessible to people, and by data I mean it could be you know government agencies having data on unemployment rates or water quality or um, suicide rates or any kind of data like that. And right now it's all um, been in databases and spreadsheets, and it makes it too hard for most people to use. And so um, through when I was working at a think tank, I came to see that people like right actually they're really interested in it when they can see it when it's in graph form mm. but really simple graph form and and through that process it's like oh all right so there's people actually want that content it's just that it's too hard for them to use and so there's a huge difference between what's available and what's accessible so i threw together the site that's been live uh, for the last two and a half years at wikinewzealand.org and just to test and go right do people want to use this how valuable will it be and the response has been really Really wonderful, and that has made me happy. <laughs> and, well, and we've used some of your graphs. We've, oh, we good. Have, yeah, we've shared a whole bunch of the the, um, the gender um, yep. oh, cool. imbalance the, within yes, IT. And yes. the, yeah, absolutely. And and so through that and going right, okay, people definitely want to use it, and kind of spending the last two years kind of gathering user requirements and and just basically having conversations with hundreds of people and and saying, yep, it's worth it now to step back and to design this properly and now that we understand the pieces and what it needs to deliver. And so the last kind of six to eight months we've spent uh, architecting a new back-end platform which we uh, have now, you know, functioning and I've been demoing and it's called Grace and that um, brings <laughs> data in at um, uh, imports. Little really question. Data, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, did you want, did you want me to answer that question <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty funny because it was the middle of the night and we were all on Slack talking away trying to think of a name. And they're like, oh, we just we need to start the code base, give me a name. And we're like, oh, and I'm like, oh, I'll just call it Grace then. I didn't actually realise at the time that it was going to become something that we this talked about externally. Hard coded into everything, yeah. It actually is, and it's fine. It's, you know, like it's fine. It is, um, it's a wonderful time. I'm, I'm proud of it, but it's pretty amusing now. <laughs> that was cool. Next up is Ian Appley from Hack Mirama and many blogs online. Jason Gleason from 8 Wide. Brenda and Sandy from Nomad 8, Tim Kong from Infrarel, Amber Craig from almost every Everywhere. digital thing I can think of. NZ, Internet mm. NZ. Uh, what's their... Oh, she's got a uh, podcast. BTA? B yeah. BTA uh, Vodcast? That's, That's very right. Anyway, yes. from everywhere, as you yes, say. Yes, from uh, yeah, any channel you can think of. And also, last up on this segment, is uh -huh. Bianca Mueller from Law Down Under. Cloud is just simply a different 
deli delivery mechanism for IT. It's very simple. Rather than us buying stuff, we just now rent it. And we can literally rent it by the second if we want to. Um, and yep, there's standards and IAS and PAS and this and that and mm. and everything else. But the bottom line is basically, rather than you investing in a heavy infrastructure set of things and physical boxes and all of the things that you need to manage that, you just you buy it as a service. You put your credit card in and off you go. I giggled. You know, I hope we moved on or whatever and you and I know <laughs> that's not the case. What's the, what's the phrase? Uh, dinosaur IT. Dinosaur IT. Is that well, the, the server box guys? The box the, huggers. The, yeah, yeah. The yeah, ones yeah. that need to touch Still the metal. Still with some of them right yeah. now. Yeah. Yes. They can't let go. Is right. No, well, I don't know. Can they let go? What is it? Why, why well, haven't so they... They're so used to what they do. They, they don't... You assume they want to learn more because that's in the, ga the game that they're in, right? Hmm. They like to have the boxes. The book. I think what we're seeing is the death of IT. In the next sort of five to ten years, IT will be dead. And even the phrase information technology is likely just to, to not be used. It just, technology in the next sort of decade will reach a point where it's just life. Mm. You know, we won't talk about um, furniture. We don't talk about furniture now in terms of I buy chairs and I buy tables and this is the best table and so on and so forth. They just kind of exist. So IT in itself is, is vanishing and these guys are holding on to it and it definitely is going to impact um, their jobs there's absolutely uh, there's no denying it what they have to do is embrace it so the day we resigned um, it was very very, ner very nerve wracking for the two of us we mm. worked together we were like basically we're going into our bosses of our company and kind of saying yeah um, we're not going to be here anymore sorry we're making a uh, product thanks but boy um, they may one day replace you <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they figured that out. Yeah. So you're going to tell them that right now? No, they, they figured that out pretty quick, though. <laughs> but um, anyway, so we, yeah, so we went in, and straight after that, I was like, I need, a, I need a beer. I need a beer to relax in some way. So we went to Fork and Brewer, yep. right next to where we worked. And um, they had just opened, because it was noon. <laughs> so we kind of went in, and like, I, um, I asked the bartender, what would you recommend for two guys who just quit their day jobs to run a startup? And he said, well, 8-Wired have a semiconductor, or sorry, the superconductor, which is about 8.5%. Like, that'll do. <laughs> yeah, <it's not> a... <laughs> So that was our, yeah, our, the namesake brewery, and that yeah. you know, became our first product. beer of freedom. It's, um, it's companies who have the right agile culture. Yeah. Uh, at, from, the, from the very beginning, yeah. it's, um, it's difference between being agile and doing agile. Being agile is a mindset, and uh, you walk into companies like Snapper. Uh, Snapper is an incredibly well-lit company, mm -hmm. and uh, they have an awesome culture. They are agile, but we're a bit on the chaos side. The same for trade me. Yeah. And um, if you got that culture, it's actually um, that's those are companies that get it, and then you introduce. Um, Techniques, principles, ideas, and um, you can be per pervasive throughout yeah. the organisation. You know, how do we use software to uh, manage behaviour? Mm. That's that big idea of the gamification of the process. And so, there's a number of apps where you can track students' behaviour and give them stars. And it's an online app, and then it links into their phone, and and I, you know, and you see the promotional stuff, and and it's and you just like. And as a teacher, I'm like, but. That conversation, that relationship, you're real, they're real. As mm. you're walking up and down or around the room, why not instead of tapping your iPad, why don't you just sit with them and say, I really like that writing. Yeah. I like the effort you've put in there. Yeah. And and yes, that's not then transferable to an e-portfolio or to a, you know, some online management system. Or metric. But, or metric. Thing, but, yeah. you know, for, for, for a large number of our children and our young people, adults actually meeting them where they are, and paying attention to where they are, what they're doing, that's the bit that matters. And if you have kids, you know that. Mm -hmm. you know, I always sometimes think, yeah, but if you were a parent, would you use this software in your kids? <laughs> would, it, would it be yeah, worth the yeah. effort instead of just going, I'm going to sit with you and show you how to tie your shoes? My concern about grads at this stage is that in a lot of corporations, they're sort of just chucked in and mm -hmm. see float rather mm -hmm. than actually chucked in and, you know, how can we help you and that type of thing. And that's probably... One bugbear that I sort of have is in a lot of corporations we have, there's not a lot of focus on bringing young people through the different areas. 
So in architecture, mm. um, there's not a lot of women and there's barely anyone under 40 in some cases, let alone, you know, 30. So um, it's quite an interesting department. And and also, I mean, you talk about, are you talking about where you are now, but also just generally? Anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I've been at Telecom, Westpac, ANZ, um, and I've really only worked with one other female architect. Is there, so it's like the succession plan, isn't it? It's, it's thinking that obviously no one's going to be around forever. Yeah. And it take, it, in that case, it was an individual that said, well, I'm not going to be here forever, I don't want to do this forever. I'm going to make sure that there are people coming up, not just underneath, but past me. The thing that was interesting actually was just before I came on board, the gentleman who mentored me actually had an accident, and it was a bit of a life or death accident. Gosh, yeah. And so they sort of learnt, well, crap, you have a wealth of knowledge, mm. yeah. and how do we pass that on? And so I'm not sure whether that sort of kick-started mm. a lot of it as well. But it just amazes me that we, you know, we can never afford to have any staff, and yet we're still not being able to afford to bring up the youth. Yeah. And to sit down with us and go through how to do things. And at least to get a basic understanding of what intellectual property is, because yeah. it's hard to protect something when you're not even in a position to see it or understand it, because it's intangible. Well, that thing that you went through, there was, you know, there's trademarks and then there was creative rights. And mm-hmm. I was sitting there going, I didn't know that existed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a thing, is it? Yep. And that's a thing that those in the in the circumstances should be looking after. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And then you go, oh, but we've got. That's what I'm yes, about. that's what I mean. Usually, you sit on mountains of you know potential assets you could make money out, mm. and you're just not aware of it, mm. and that makes companies extremely inefficient. And. Um, Success sort of breeds success, and um, yeah. those companies that are actually successful, they look very, very carefully after their IP portfolio. And it's probably not done to just once go and register a trademark or register a design right. It's something that has to continuously man- be managed. Mm. It's, it's ongoing. It's not, and it's probably not a purely legal task either. It's more a strategic and business management task. Where do you want to drive your business in the future and where do you want to generate the revenue from? Chances are that it's actually from your IP. And if you want to do that, you have to understand what your assets are, what you have and what you could commercialize and where. And that's the whole point of that white paper to really briefly explain how all those little bits hang together. Wonderful. And we plow on through the gold that we've, uh, from we've discovered through all our interviews. Coming up next, we have Andrew Schofield from Timely, um, Jack Yang from Luciri, I've never heard how to say it, um, Cameron from Star Now, uh, Ben Keeps from Diversity, Nick Clark and Richard Corney from Flight Coffee, and finally in this segment, we've got Matt Cobham from Vizbot. So how yeah. do you pick and choose yeah. the types of things that, yeah. that you're going to offer? You know? yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge, and we have a feedback request site, and right now there are 650 feature requests. You know. <laughs> are any of them the same one? <laughs> no, they've all been moderated. I mean, they've all been, you know, we've looked at it and gone, that's a good idea. You yeah, know. 600. And, and, you know, so there's no lack of ideas, yeah. you know. Uh, it's just sort of figuring out implementation, or yeah, and, why, basically, right? And they fall on a wide spectrum of big, huge projects to little nice things that, you know, quick wins that no, you know, no yeah. problem. We'll add those into kind of edge case, kind of weird stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that yeah. we probably won't get to ever. But you know, <laughs> yeah, you have to be quite brutal at going through that list and you know, and uh, and choosing the ones that kind of match your yeah. your strategy and your vision for the product. Yeah. And saying no and discarding a lot of them <laughs> because they don't quite, you know, they don't fall on that. On Just that kind of focus. Fit in your core mission, right? Yeah. Fit in within yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Now I started um, Ash as a calligrapher and a proofreader. A um, calligrapher. Yeah. At at the World Trade Center. Now there's a building in Wellington. Yes. Spelt with the, yes. Spelt with the American way. If you look at the car park, the sign is still spelt the American way. Yes. Which is wrong, because there's no such thing as American English. There's just English and mistakes. <laughs> 
I love that quote. I'm writing that down somewhere. Um, That's awesome. And anyway, so there's a mistake on the sign that says World Trade Center. The center's about it. There's a um, company that I used to do a lot of contract work for as a, as a young kid. And um, I guess I started off, you know, with, with doing that stuff really early. And I just branched and everything else. Because that's the one thing about New Zealand, you cannot be a specialist. If you specialise, you, you start. You know, I've just written an article in, in Ruggiero called The Internet is the Answer, which is a counterpoint to the new book, The Internet is not the answer. Yes, yeah, well. Um, because I believe, you know, it, it opens doors. It is a great democratiser. It is a great thing to level the playing field. As long as, of course, we keep big corporates away from trying to control it. Um, you know, there's something really for the people. And we all should have a, a fair go at it. You know, those people talking about um, how net neutrality was a bad thing. I mean, they're actually in netizens saying it's a bad thing. How is this a bad thing? Oh, because government should stay over. Now they're going to Well, no, government's stepping in because it could actually have been become very, very broken. Um, well, you look and, at the duopoly that was happening in America. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and, and maybe if your governments weren't so damn corrupt, you wouldn't be worried about them. Ah, that's, that's <laughs> more a statement on the government than actually the quote-unquote policy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, what, what we do need is to keep it a level playing field so all entrepreneurs that we have a chance to really express themselves. So we thought, hey, look, you know, we know how to build websites. We can, we can build this website and, um, and it'll be great. So we, we sat down, started coding. And from start to finish, so from idea to basically finish, and double quotes, from, yeah. from idea to launch, uh, <laughs> took us about a month. Wow. But yeah, that was, that was mainly... Um, That's pretty agile. <laughs> pretty, yeah. I mean, look, don't, don't go back and look at that very first version through um, the web archive or anything, because it's... Um, you know, I'm going to now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it worked. It worked. <laughs> and so it took us a month, and about maybe, I don't know, you know, at least a week or so of that was just dealing with banks, because... You know, we you, you couldn't just sign up and, and kind of take transactions. We had to go in and, and, you know, convince the banks that, you know, these three New Zealanders who just arrived in London were, you know, trustworthy and, right. and you yeah. know. Um, so anyway, we set it up. We launched on, it was late September 2004. So we'd made a, I'd made a few phone calls the week before launch to get um, people with casting calls. And so we'd, we had casting calls on the site, and then on, I think it was a Friday night, we, we basically put the site live, um, set up some Google AdWords ads to go out, and then we took off and went to a friend's place and had dinner and drinks, because we, we were pretty excited. That's launch, right? That's there was a launch, launch yeah. party, yeah. yeah. There was a launch party, and more of a, more of a um, don't want to just sit there and hit refresh <laughs> party, because... <laughs> You know, we, we, we obviously were pretty bullish on this thing. We'd, we'd spent a month or so building it, but, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know if it was going to work. But anyway, we came back and there were 20, I think there were 20 members, uh, maybe 20, 20 or 50 members, and we had taken two payments, so we'd earned 20 pounds. So that's overnight? So that was in the first few hours. First few hours. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so we were yeah. over the moon, you know, because... You know, like I say, we don't want to just sit there hitting refresh and, and you know, it's a ghost town. But when we came back and, and, you know, then hit refresh and saw a couple of payments, and obviously £20 doesn't sound like a lot, but for oh, the first few hours, start, it was, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say is that when I started blogging, I mean, I remember back in probably 2007, I was invited to join this new, or to help found this, this new blog um, in the US called Cloud. Yeah. Um, and, and they were like, yeah, it's cool, you can you know, help, um, you can be a founder, and there was a company that was sponsoring that, Soho, and um, everyone was going to be paid. And I actually said, no, I don't want to be paid, because I'm not actually doing it for money, but I've never been to Silicon Valley. Actually, I don't know where Silicon Valley is, mm-hmm. I need, and I needed to Google it. Mm-hmm. And, I, and so say, I, I don't really know either. So I said to them, look, you know, I honestly don't want to be paid, but uh, I'd quite like to have a visit to, you know, I'd like to come out to a conference. Mm. Um, so how about we work something out like that? And that's kind of been my... I, I mean, I guess if there's a common thing, it's that I've never really been focused on how can I directly monetize whatever it is I'm doing, mm. but rather how can I... And it sounds kind of grandiose, but how can I use what I'm doing to learn something new or mm. achieve something better or, mm. or whatever? And, um, yeah, it's kind of worked out, I guess. And we're also yeah. doing a small little coffee shop in the middle of Melbourne. Um, and like I'm, I'm pretty pumped because it gives us an opportunity due to that population where we can actually kind of, rather than kind of, um, I guess, doing some big general ideas really, really well because you kind of have to keep everybody in Wellington. Mm. Over there we can actually get a little bit more niche oh. and focus on, I guess, like the really find what, what it is that gets us up in the morning when it comes to specialty coffee and 
use that as like a pretty awesome display room and yeah yeah it's gonna be cool it's gonna mm. be fun so we're so kind of have, yeah you can actually play with it a little bit can't you? yeah pretty mm. much so we're just kind of still still in the planning design process but um it's starting to shape up to to become a pretty interesting concept and like t to be honest one of the best things about it um i think anyways we've, we've been able to offer um a couple of our guys back here in wellington um opportunities to go over there and be like hey kind of at the moment you guys are killing what you're doing here but there's no room for you to level up in terms of uh, management or like company structure because of oh. where this size. In a year's time, you know, we'll be a bit bigger and maybe then, but you know, if you want to wait around, you're more than welcome to. Otherwise, we want to kind of encourage you to go over and do you want to run Very this? Nice yeah, do you want to? So you're nurturing your own talent at the kind, same time. Kind of, eh? Mm. Um, and you know, the benefit for that is like we've, we've got our people, we like our families plus, you know, which is cool. We get to continue working with them and watching them grow, but also it, it takes our culture over there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're not kind of having a and it's not like you hire strangers because obviously you get to know your new people, but for us it's kind of like it's a safe bet, in a way. Yeah, and um, it's as much about giving them opportunity as well as, you know, I mean a career in coffee for someone who's not within our industry may seem a little bit like of a, uh, um, a bit of a strange career choice. Um, you know, a barista working as a barista. You know, like what is that? What do you do? You know, I've, I've heard commentary around people say, "Well, you just make coffee," and it's like, okay, yeah, sure, <laughs> yes, we do just Simplified make coffee. Version. But, yeah. but when 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 it, when it comes down to talking about a career within coffee, it doesn't it doesn't stop um, at, at the coffee machine in a cafe. It really just begins there, and and coffee has this amazing ability to. To do something that I've, that never ceases to amaze me, and that is, is it just transcends cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, political beliefs, and and systems, and then it brings people together. And you see that no more, uh, it, it's no more evident, you know, than at the World Barista Champs. I think there's a reason for that, and in, in the engineering, especially construction, I th <laughs> the actual technology on site, it goes without saying, they need to have, and they have to have, <laughs> if they want to keep going forward and doing things better. But the actual principles of the software and tech, the methodologies in which they work, the reason why they've been employed is that you don't really know what a software program or application is going to be like until you start using it. When you start using it, oh, this is great, but I actually wanted it like this. So you have to have those lean and agile approaches, like the scrum, the sprints, the continual iterations over what you're doing because there's such great change. Traditionally in engineering, a project manager at the start, who's the head of the project, goes through, writes out a Gantt chart of the project, hmm. planning it. <clears throat> this is what we're going to do, and this is our endpoint over here. While you still need that, in reality, you're going to get maybe two weeks into the project. As soon as you start digging, you realise that the ground is much different to what you're expecting. Oh. <laughs> Completely blows your program out of water, and in the end, you have a six month delay. Everything on site changes from day to day. Wow, know. really? Because I'm thinking it's bricks on bricks. No, not at all. It's always true. This is what people want to soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, you know. I'm learning. I'm learning. That's what people want you to believe. But yeah. so there's just so many variables, and it is like not just cut and paste like us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's <laughs> just yeah, like there's just so many variables. There's so many things going on that no one can ever account for. Although they would like you to believe they could. That's the reason why they're always stressed that budgets are always being kind of teetering on whether or not they can make it or not. If they could like employ some of the lean methodologies and have some of the agile and, and kind of like the, the scrum, for example, if they could do that in engineering, like, the cost savings would be huge. Next segment is uh, with Janine Crosin from Flossy.com, Lucy Law, who was based in the law office and now in Singapore, Michelle Burke, who was at the Reserve Bank, and John Gonzalez from Hashbang, Julian Apatu, and Courtney Foon. Enjoy. Um, so Stephen Torrance is my CTO, um, and we sat down, you know, really took it from a customer experience point of view. And I think that's where we've got a real edge in the market. I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, quite often what happens in tech-led startups where the CTO is the CEO is that they can, and I'm sorry for all those of us not taking offence on this, <laughs> that they can look at it quite from a development point of view and not necessarily from a customer experience side. Right, yeah. Um, and being a female customer um, and you know, really intrinsically understanding what the pain is in their market, I could really think through what that journey could look like and what it needs to look like and then breaking it into the different kind of audiences that you might have. And that was from there what we were able to say, 
hey, so what's the kind of like minimum viable product to get this to market for a start for these audiences? And now how would we build that on the future? Mm. Uh, and to be honest, there's a lot of drawing involved. There's, yeah. there's a lot of whiteboards that allow you to kind of go, you know, if we want to get into that point, we would start here, and then how do we cut, like, half of it out? It's all about the simplicity. Like, how do we make this as, as easy for someone to use as they possibly could? Yeah. Uh, and then you just kind of get going. You start <laughs> building. <laughs> you have the, the, the situations where people are coming together, but you also have the breakups. Yes, the what breakups. Can, what can our listeners do to avoid that kind of situation? Uh, I think or is there a way to avoid up. it? Yeah, yeah. Don't break up. Don't break up. Well, yeah, yeah. Stay together happens. for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, practically speaking, just not even around the legal situation, it's always good to have worked with your co-founder before you guys get into a formal arrangement. So uh, okay. it's like it's good to date before you agree to marry someone. Yeah. Like, yeah. You test the waters. Yeah, right. You've been through stressful times with them um, rather than some teams that are just... Um, kind of, even in Lightning Lab, um, when they just shove people together, or I was going to say that's an interesting yeah, start like, to a marriage, then, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, it's, it's, it's an arranged marriage, really, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah, it is. It's yeah, definitely yeah. an arranged. Not to say arranged marriages can't work, because uh, they do okay. work in many countries as well. Um, it's just, it's always better to know who you're getting into a marriage with. Yes. Yeah. Um, but then legally, it's good to have documentation around what each other's expectations are. Um, in terms of the shares, I'd highly suggest um, share vesting, which is um, uh, you don't earn all your shares automatically. You have to earn it over a period of time. So that maybe over two years, you might oh, slowly see. get your yeah. 50%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I hate big data. We've had this discussion before. Yes, we did. And we did. <laughs> we, we've had this discussion over beer at least twice. Yes, I, I, I tipped around that. Right? We're yeah, yeah. data scientists now, aren't they? Is that the new term for these guys? Well, I mean, right? uh, for, for the people doing that work, yeah. Mm. yeah. But around big data, I mean, I just hate that word because it, it it's, ma- negative, it's not... It? Well, it's not that it's negative, it's unclear. Right. So, so what do you mean by big? I mean, when, when the concept of big data first came out, it was more around the unstructured data that lives around us. But these days when people use big data, they seem to just talk about volumes. And so I get really frustrated by that, and I've had conversations at work about that as well, about how just because you're going to have 250 million rows that doesn't make it big data. It is, in fact, a structural database. It has it has rows and columns, and it's very clear what they are. Every every row looks exactly the same. You know, the values yeah. change obviously, but they are they are exactly the same. They are not big data. It's not a big data problem. And so, I just I hate using. I would much rather go back to unstructured data. Well, improv and, and well, I'm not saying it necessarily, but improv is complete opposite of that. Though, isn't yeah. It? Just, well, just, see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I suppose you you try and make it seem like it's all just flowing, but there is structure to it. Yeah. 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 And that's Applying I guess rules. For one of the better phrases. A simple rule in improv is, um, and this really struck a chord with me is, in order for it to have a really good improv show, is to not think about yourself, but to think about the other person who's on stage with you, and to make them look good. And if you're both making each other look good, mm. then you'll, you'll have a great show. Because there seems to be, especially in the, in the um, first few classes, there's uh, a bit of a competition going on with the, the new students trying to be the funny guy or trying yeah. to be the funny person in the class, which is just a natural thing to do. But then uh, you end up getting to points where you, you have this weird competitive nature on stage where I don't want you to look funny, so I'm going to make you look bad right now. And it just creates a really bad... Oh, bad, bad yeah. environment. So yeah, it's also one day and all day, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. kind of think, and there's also this uh, thing that people want to be more the, the wittiest one in the group. So mm-hmm. you're trying to find ways to play off what you just did to make yourself look good. And when you get stuck in that mode of, of trying to be wittier, then you actually lose a lot of that imp- improvisation ability. Yep. You kind of just get stuck in thoughts. So <laughs> it's better just to go with the flow and just to make this person look better. And then they'll do the yeah. same for you. That's a very cool attitude. I saw uh, programming uh, as a brilliant expression of creativity. People thought programmers weren't very creative. I thought I was pretty creative mm. at the time. They thought designers were creative. So I thought... I want to be creative, I want to be a designer. So I jumped into design, and that's when all the prices, well, all the pay 
for developers suddenly skyrocketed. So just you stepped out. Just disgusting. No. Out. Ah. Uh. Oh, I was so disappointed in myself. Bad decision. That's right. The designers get. I'm not there that money now. <laughs> Good designers, Mike. No, I think it was. That's where part of the problem lies. Well, you know, I'm creating or you're creating mm. this thing for someone that's not actually us. I'm, we're never going to use it. Yeah. And that should be the easiest flag to say, well, we need to do service design thinking or design thinking. But generally, it's not still. And it's hard if you're in a team where, you, you know, your managers are like, that is not what I had expected. That does not look like mm. what I thought was what we had briefed. And it's like, well, is this for you or is this for our customers? Because I'm, I'm kind of getting confused here. Yeah. And that's it. I think that's the major struggle at the moment is people, yeah, they value it, but when they actually have to implement and, and go, is this is this what I thought it was? Mm. Not for me. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't, I didn't design it for you. <laughs> <That's right, yeah. laughs> design it for our customer, right? And it, it's, it's hard. That's hard. Yes. That's always going to be hard, no matter what, because... We have clients like that too. Where they it do it our, would always be hard. Survey yeah. of one, basically. They do a survey mm. of one of themselves. This is how I'd use it. But you're not the customer. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you say that? And how do you say yeah. that in a way that doesn't seem so abrupt? I've had, I've had you to know? just do that now. Well, you yeah, say you you're do. not the customer. Yeah. We're, well, it's not for you. Yeah. You may like it this way. How would I say? No one's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, swear words, probably. Yeah, would you? <laughs> <laughs> ho Still with us, everyone? Not long to go now. We're up to episode what was 62 out of 77, 78. And next up, we have Brendan Ritchie from DTS. Devin Moodley, who was at Zero, wonderful person. Alistair Thompson, who was or is at Scoop, I know no, he's no longer in the country, oh. Grant Robinson and Daryl Gray from Atomic, uh, Kate Henderson, Vic Uni student, Google personage, and Ben Deflau, who's from All Accounted For. So if, <laughs> if, you, if you do one thing, you're not going to be around for long. Mm. Um, and people don't want a million different invoices. So um, the issue is that it's hard to do everything well, particularly if you're not the biggest company so you've got to get scale and we've really driven scale so um, I sort of said it before but I don't think that if you're a company uh, a telco an ISP or a telco and you're earning probably less than five million dollars and you don't have some pretty innovative plans or dynamic plans for growth I don't think you're going to be around in 24 months um, there's too many barriers to, to your success at that level so for us it was about going well um, let's get beyond that $5 million turnover so that we're in a position to be able to, to have the staff and the knowledge and the, um, the in-house development skills to deploy you know, top-end solutions for clients. So that ended up being including a, um, a purchase of another company in December that specialised in IP voice. Um, mm-hmm. So that allowed us to very much have our own you know, uh, telephony network. Uh, as you said, ISP is a core business. Then you've got managed routers, managed firewalls, hosting, um, you know, there's other options, I guess, things like network management um, as well, um, and uh, I guess uh, network architecture. There's, there's a lot of other things we can do without conflicting with our channel, who are primarily uh, managed service providers in the land space. So, yeah, we're trying to add a lot of extra services, but be careful not to annoy our partners, and also, um, I guess, not to overextend our capabilities to the point that we do anything in a, in a sort of a half-hearted fashion. Um, concept in my mind where. Time is the only commodity you can buy back. Mm-hmm. So you can do like as much as you can with with everything else. You can you can make more money. You can you know hang out with friends and do all these crazy things. But if you don't spend that time properly, yeah. you can never buy it back. Yeah. And so that's why I try and I think to myself, flip. I've got an opportunity every every day to do something a little bit different or to make the most of it. Especially coming from a place like South Africa where you don't have these opportunities. Mm. If I were still living back there, I wouldn't be doing design. Yeah? yeah. Like not at all. I, I I tell people now that I you know I do design and I'm an artist and they're like, man, you must have a hard life. I'm like, what do you mean? Because <laughs> like, you know the whole like yeah. American stereotype, you know, the guys you know living in a studio eating yeah. baked beans with a blanket around him, drawing stuff. That's not design here in New Zealand. <laughs> here, like designers are driving flash cars and buying a new MacBook every freaking couple of weeks. I watch, and it's like, yeah, it's it's, it's ridiculous. Well, no, I mean, I, I actually felt that night as if this is if my life had ended. Mm. All of my life's work was was gone, almost certainly, um, almost certainly the internet. <laughs> Idea was 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 in, in, in disarray, and and so was so was Scoop, and um, so was the relationship with the investor, and, and and the truth is, I mean, and then yeah, so so it was a very very hard time. So we then basically I then went into silence, 
because I couldn't say anything publicly um, unless it was agreed. And I didn't I didn't want anyone to say anything publicly because I just I mean as far as I was concerned, the most important thing was let's all just shut the fuck yeah. up. Yes. <laughs> and shut up. Let's all chill out. Right. Stop the panicking. Yes. Don't talk to the media. Yeah. It doesn't help. <laughs> Anyway, so... Um, You've heard that from both sides there in one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It doesn't help if you're in a conflict. I mean, just, just as a mm. general piece of, piece of advice, mm. never tweet in anger. It's good advice. Never and never... Um, yeah, never ring up a journalist with a story that you think is going to hurt someone else. Because <laughs> it almost certainly is going to hurt you. Yeah. It looks from the outside like we've launched a product into market and now we're just going to sell it. But um, from I guess from our point of view, like we feel like it's a little bit like an iceberg. You know, like maybe not even less like an iceberg. Like one percent of our product is kind of above the water, and people are like, look at that. And and now we just need to bring the other ninety nine percent of it up and show them. Um, and we spent like a year and a half building foundational stuff that we're now just starting to show. So that's exciting. Like a product in a year's time is going to be different, yeah, you know, and a lot bigger and a lot better. So so we're starting to sell, but really, like we're you know kind of looking more twenty four months out. And what the product looks like then, which is more interesting. But that role has changed as well, right? Like, we're, like what we're doing on a daily basis has changed quite a bit. As far yeah. as like you know, starting off being totally the ones designing, yeah. the ones coding, and then as the team has kind of grown, we're up to about 11 people now. We're kind of like, got some people to help with all that. <laughs> yeah, we're the idiots now. Yeah, no, we're the idiots, yeah. Like, and um, just uh, shuffling cards around on chip trello all day. And, own documents, but um, <laughs> but um, you know that. You know, but you know, extrapolate that out a year. That'll be really kind of fascinating if we keep growing. Um, the speed that we have, and you know, it'll be, it'll be really fun to be bringing on lots of new people, new kind of personalities and talents and stuff like that. So I think that, that that's the other side of it, right? Like just having the joy, of kind of building a team. It's, mm. it's pretty fun. My first ever job interview in my entire life was with was Google, Google over the phone, <laughs> and I was live coding into. A Google Doc. No way. It was the most intense experience I've ever had. Wow. I was, oh, I was terrified. <laughs> and the hours leading Real up to that, I've never felt so sick. It was just. <laughs> I, I felt better in every job interview since then. <laughs> it can never, it ever was, be as Yeah, well exactly. Fact. It was just straight in the deep end. That was amazing. Yeah, and that was my first ever job interview. Um, <laughs> yeah. But so they they had my name from that, and so when it came to the Google Student Ambassador thing, they usually recruit about January. Oh, okay. Um, and I got an email from them saying, "Oh, we thought you might be interested in this." And then I also got an email from um, a guy called Elf Eldridge who works for the university in the outreach department. So I'd worked with him on outreach stuff. I think he sent it to me too, saying, "Oh, I think you'd be good at this." And so I applied for it, and then two weeks later I found out that I got it, and then two weeks after that I was flying to Sydney for training. Wow, cool. It was a very fast Oh, experience. so it's a, it's, a, it's a full program with oh, yeah. things that you do and... Support. Yeah, so we do literally work for Google. Yeah. Yeah, which is a very fun thing to have in our CV. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. One of the most common issues is, is people don't plan. So they have this great idea or they have a great opportunity to, to generate you know, a lot of cash, uh, but they just don't plan. So, you know, they might see, let's say they go out contracting, for example, in that IT space, you know, they've been do working on POE, now they've got an opportunity to go out and earn 150 bucks an hour, 200 bucks an hour, whatever it is, and they're like, cool, we're going to be turning over 200 grand a year, sweet, I'm going <laughs> to spend it like there's no tomorrow, da da da, but they haven't planned. So, yeah. how long... Firstly, how long's the contract for? You mm -hmm. know, if it rolls over every three months, what's going to happen at the end of the next three months? Yeah, it might be looking good to roll over then, but you know, six, twelve months beyond that. Um, similarly, in terms of okay, so you're going to have potentially all this extra cash. What are you going to do with it? Um, are you going to you know perhaps invest into something else? Maybe it's some investment property. Maybe it's some shares. That sort of stuff. Uh, and probably one of the most important stuff, have you put aside money for tax? <laughs> That's where they get you, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There's an interesting stat um, out there that of businesses that fail, um, in the two-thirds of them that fail in their second year is because they've failed to plan for the tax. Really? Because the way, way things happen is 
first year, you don't pay any tax. Yeah. Yeah. So you've just got all this cash sitting in a savings account, <laughs> or, or maybe not, because you might have spent it already. Um, and then you come to year two, the accounts have been done, and um, all of a sudden you've got this massive tax liability, and essentially you pay two years of tax in, in one year. It's not first year free after all, no, like they no. pitch it. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, you can make it work for you. Yeah. Um, like if you've got a, a, you know, your own home, you can sit it in a flexi facility if you're disciplined and save yourself some interest, that sort of stuff. Um, but if you, you know, it's one of the things we stress with the clients right from the get-go is you need to be putting aside this sort of percentage. So oh. we come up with a, with a number based on what they're likely to be earning and say, right, you need to be putting this, side, this number aside for GST, income tax, ACC levies is another one that people forget oh, yeah, about, yeah. Um, so, that, so that they know and can plan for that. Cool. Well, the next segment is uh, Amy Whitcroft, Nadia McGregor from the School of Design Thinking, Rod Zuri, I think he has something to do with financial services or software, uh, Oren Shaw from ERA, Kendall Flutie from Banker, and Brenda Wallace from Rabbit Tech. Is That's it just like you? Started. You don't have a committee of you? No, it's just people? me. Just you. Well, it's, it's, it's all the various Amy's, but it's me, yes. Yeah. It's the Amy that is me in this body. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Starts with one, yeah. ends with one. Yeah, they can't only um, one. Yeah. I've recently had um, the Science and Society group at VUW come on board as sort of, I guess you could call them strategic partners. Okay. Nice. Uh, sometimes they're, they're very happy to, you know, help me interface with the scientific community oh, and the yeah. research community. Um, the last Nerd Nights that, that was in mid-September, they actually um, wrangled the speakers for me because I'd run out of spoons at that point. <laughs> so they hopefully dove in with some fresh new spoons for me. Um, so you can expect in future Nerd Nights, occasionally speakers provided by the Science and Society Group. So that's really cool. Yes. Yeah. And looking, for, you know, all, all of these things are great. I, I figure it's, it's a community thing. So the more that people want to get involved with it, the happier I am, yeah. frankly. Design thinking is thinking like a designer and design something that the customer or client wants. But I was told just today by a designer yeah. uh, that is, uh, design thinkers don't think like a designer. Oh, well, there you they, go. Don't, they don't like They've got a love her hate relationship with design thinking designers, yes. I tell you that. But anyway, they, she thought that design thinkers think like psychologists but act like designers. So I guess that makes sense as well. Oh, I can see that. Yeah. If youth employment's the issue, how do we deal with it at zero? And we, it was really clear, we actually light up our now half, half a million customers. So if, if, if small business can add half an employee or a full-time person, that actually moves the needle at scale. So what we've done is some, first of all, we've communicated to our accounting partners and our small businesses that youth employments get sold by small business. We've done guides uh, for each country, which uh, this is what minimum wage is, youth employment, um, sorry, minimum wage, um, what living wages, what uh, probation periods are and how to use them, where to find young people, how to manage young people. And what we'll do over the next year, hopefully, is actually some calculators where people with their own numbers can see what it would be like to add um, a part-time person or create a new youth job. So, so at scale, we can actually hit some of these big social issues. Mm. That's cool. Why? Because <coughs> you, you only have one life, so you might as well do something purposeful. And I think, um, you know, when you're a small software company and a small company, you think, government help me, you get up to a certain point, like we're at, mm. where that's actually more of a peer. So we're doing a lot of work with IRD, trying to take money out of their budget because the taxpayers, we don't want them to waste money. But also we want to um, make things much easier for small business owners because mm. that does actually grow the um, economy. But then you kind of realise that they can only move so quickly. And, you know, we'll spend $300 million this year so we can use that investment to do really good things for our country and the countries we're in and actually move things forward, which mm. is the excitement and why I'm all in on zero for a long, long time. So we can actually do really exciting, important things. And, you know, when you're lying on your deathbed, you know, that, that would be, I, I would think, a very satisfying thing to look at and see you actually made a difference. I don't agree with that kind of model of work yourself as hard as you can because you do burn out. Yeah. It just yeah. happens. Um, and the quote unquote successes in my mind are the ones that happened to, to make it through or get caught early because if they hadn't, they would have burnt out. I mean, most people say burn out. But the success is the one. And when I success, it's that quote unquote success that you talk about that someone bought them for a billion dollars or six dollars mm-hmm. fifty, which is not a success necessarily. But it's that's the story that mm-hmm. everyone hears. No one hears about all the other ninety nine percent that didn't. 
Yeah, we never hear about the 99% who didn't, the 99% whose companies failed and didn't make any money, the 99% who worked 100 hours for six months and had nothing to show for it. Yes. Yeah. And everything burned, upon, burned away. We're told these stories of the people who did succeed because they're the stories we want to hear. Mm. We want to believe that we're special enough to be like them. Yes. Even though statistically it is highly unlikely yes. that we will be. Yes. And 99% who knows. The more we talk percent. about it, the more it sounds like lotto to me, really, in the end. It's yeah. Like, like lottery. It is. Yeah. And some of the dialogue in Silicon Valley, like the critics, are starting to call it the startup lottery. Is that right? Yeah. That's what it's called. The startup lottery. Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah and, and I think something that I really ben- benefited from with Dev Academy was the emotional intelligence side of things. Mm. So, something I wasn't expecting going into it despite the fact they told me several times in emails this, this thing was happening. <laughs> um, I guess I didn't take it seriously, but I'm so glad I got to experience it. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So it was kind of based on a book called Search Inside Yourself, which was written by, I think, a Google, Google guy, um, of course. <laughs> and it's all about... Um, Is this the HR guy? Uh, he was part of, well, people or whatever they call it. Oh, perhaps, perhaps. Check it out. Yeah. Search, yeah, search inside yourself. Okay. He's got some YouTube clips as well that are pretty awesome. It's all about um, questioning the way you think, and I guess what I talked about earlier about expanding your mindset, um, internal reflection, and being more thoughtful, I think, about how you see the world and how you treat one another. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's really nice that they emphasize that, and I think it's something that's evident in the the tech industry as well, that people are a little bit more thoughtful. We, we're pairing with one another, we're in each other's faces, there's a lot of collaboration. Um, so you, to thrive, you've got to be, I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah, you know what e-textiles are, right? You do? Oh, good. good. You guys didn't know. My, oh, we don't know about these guys listening. I'm saying no. Oh, you're pretending oh. you don't know. Okay. Um, e-textiles, when you, if you do a circuit that's on clothing, um, you generally they're also washable with that helps with the picture here and I might do something cool like say on this hoodie and I'm intending to modify this hoodie so that when I sit down at a pub and some sports ball is playing and I'm sick of it or I don't know, days of their lives or something I don't want to watch you just make it so that when you do up your zip it closes the circuit and it transmits the TV turn off signal <laughs> oh, that's cool yeah. I thought you were just having buttons on your sleeve but that's it's cooler. a little more you know a little yeah. secret. you can have it as a button you can yeah. pull out your phone and get caught but you could just have it as a brooch maybe yeah that's and then voila, cool, eh? you could go to the gym and, you know, there's MTV going and you don't actually want to watch that particular track right yeah. now on the gym. You just do up your hoodie a bit more and it's gone. No, don't tell my gym I'm... <laughs> <laughs> you can have whole it's dance small, choreography small based thing, on what you want to happen in the yeah. house. Well, you Hold could... my lights off. Put your hands up. We could have some LEDs that change yeah. colour based on the CO2 around you. You can get on the bus and watch the CO2 levels go up and go, <laughs> what am I breathing, you know... <laughs> could be interesting. But, you know, just having clothing that reacts to the environment or does does things for you is, is a little bit more useful than pulling out a phone and trying to do that. There's no hierarchy. It's all a flat system. No one's in charge of each other. Open salary system. So, so you can set your own salary. But, but it has to be open so that everyone else can see oh. what you want. And then you then have discussions if you're not happy with what you're on or yeah. what someone else is on. So, yeah, going from that was... That's a... Wow. What, I, I didn't know that. And I, I presume that's a, the, the inspiral... Yeah. Um, influence I, for yeah, I mean, I couldn't comment on what it's like now. It definitely, they were starting out doing that yeah. back in February. I would assume they're still on that model so do you approach that with a right I'm going to go for a job they say, yeah, yeah this is the job yeah sweet mm. I, I want to do that and you want me to do that great right, I want a million dollars no 50,000 or do you how does that process work the it's setting the salary yeah it's not a negotiation yeah. I suppose is it well so we actually I was there at the very beginning when we did this and from what I remember everyone put down their salaries and I guess you could do However you wanted to judge what you should be paid, yeah. you put it down as that. And then everyone can anonymously, or not anonymously, make some kind of yes, no, and a reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we sit around in a circle and we go through everyone's, 
Can we go through any comments about it? Maybe they think you should be paid more, maybe you should be paid less, mm. and the person, if they want to, can speak up who made the comment, yeah. and you can also say how you feel about the comments you've read, yeah. and then change the salary accordingly, oh, and or then, not. Yeah. But obviously, if, if you can't agree, then it gets escalated to someone else, and they try and talk it out. Yeah. So I think different people do it on different things, and there was a few conversations around like what is this based on? Yeah. <clears throat> because comparing two people within the company compared to one of you outside of the company to a different industry, mm. you know, everyone's got different ideas. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was really interesting. It's a fascinating because it's a, it's all about that self worth. <laughs> mm. You know, what do I think I'm worth to the company? And, uh, yeah. But also industry rates outside, like what you could be employed for elsewhere. Yes. If another company could snap you up really easily for 20k more, then maybe that should be reflected, maybe it shouldn't, because, mm. yeah. Mm. Maybe trade me one call. But they did! <laughs> <laughs> NZ Tech, you did a talk at NZ Tech. Yeah. And yep. there was two things that stood out there. One was Internet of Things, and that's also on your um, Twitter stuff. Yeah. Is that yep. something you do at work? No, I know, so that's a, kind of a sideline, extracurricular activity. Okay. <laughs> and so IoT, Internet of Things, um, to me is kind of a place that is interesting for me to play somewhere between the product design from where I came from and the software of where I am. Mm. So um, I'm one of the co-organisers of the IoT meetup. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. 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 But in, it, with Chris Jackson Chris. from DNA. Yeah, yeah. So we co-organised the um, IoT meetup, mm -hmm. and it's been really successful. We've mm -hmm. we've only been around for a year, um, and we've got over 500 members. Um, yeah, and so we've just um, got permanent sponsorship for our venue from Biz Dojo. Oh, excellent! So we'll be having it there. So that's really neat. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's, I haven't been doing any IoT things, I haven't been making anything. Soldering or doing Yeah, hacking. but I just love being a part of the conversations and mm. kind of injecting thoughts about design um, into the conversations. Um, it's, that, the group at the IoT Meetup is really interesting, it's really diverse. Um, I think it would probably be one of the most diverse sort of IT groups there is because there's people there that are like product industrial designers and security experts and developers and um, all sorts of things. Mm. You should have to think about all of that. Yeah. That sort of stuff, eh? Yeah, yeah. Well, that was a lot of content to go through. It was awesome. What a big year. It was a massive year. A lot of amazing people. And we'll be back in February 2016 so. with yeah. a whole bunch more of amazing people. Yeah, so tune in then. Keep an eye on the website. We might have posts for things that are coming up. Yep. So accessgranted.nz on the website. Um, Twitter at accessgrantednz yep. and on Facebook accessgrantednz. So between now and then, you won't hear much from us, but you will in February. Thanks so much to everybody who has supported, sent in tweets of support, mm. and of course and contributed. This year was the year we got our sponsors. Mm. So thank you so much to Grant, particularly at Capiche. .co.nz for supporting us so beautifully we yeah. really appreciate it and next year is going to be bigger and better thank you right. all for listening it's been great thank you hashtag me .co .nz.